So I'm joined by Leo Panic, um, Emeritus uh, Professor at the University of Toronto, Editor at the Socialist Register, mentor to Max Shanley. <laughs> we're in TWT, we're in Liverpool, we're covering all things Labour Party related. Great to have you here. Great to be here, Aaron. I'll start with, um, I think, probably the most important question one can ask. What are your politics? I'm a socialist, uh, proudly so. Uh, and uh, I would say, honestly, that my generation of socialists uh, has failed in our attempt since the late 1960s to build an alternative to either the old Leninist communist parties or to the social democratic parties, both of whom by the 60s had run their historical course as agents of transformation. There were some of us who thought they could go off and find a better Leninism, a non-Stalinist Leninism. There were others of us uh, who, following in the trajectory of Benism and the Greater London Council, felt that you couldn't change social democracy into socialist agency any longer. And we hoped that we'd be able to create mass socialist parties outside of social democracy. We haven't done it. Well, not yet. No, and I don't think we're going to. I think what we're seeing, I think what we're seeing in the Labour Party is that it is going to have to go through those parties. Uh, we'll see what happens with them. Those, it'll inevitably lead to splits in those parties. One would hope that it'll be socialists who hold on to the party apparatus, the party tradition, uh, etc. Um, but it looks like uh, that's the way to go. Whereas back in 1979, when I wrote a piece on socialists in the Labour Party in the Socialist Register, it was the first piece I ever published in the Register, uh, I challenged Ken Coates, who was part of the Institute for Workers' Control, close to Ben, and was part of the attempt to change the party. And he had said, where have you seen a new mass socialist democratic party built outside of the old ones? And I ended my essay saying, where have you seen a social democratic party transformed into a socialist one? Mm. Um, it looks like uh, you know, what you guys are engaged in here is the way we're going to have to go. And, and it's very exciting, it's very impressive, it's very fraught. Enormous responsibility is on your shoulders. The whole world's looking at it, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, where things are at right now if you're a socialist. You often talk about the importance of democracy for socialist parties. What are the functions of having a democratic party? Because it's not just a moral um, ask, is it? You're not just saying democracy in and of itself is a positive thing, therefore these parties should be good. That democracy also serves quite important political functions. Can you sort of go over those briefly? Yeah, I mean, it, it uh, is obviously partly a matter of the experience over the last hundred years with mass working class parties uh, not having been internally democratic. And that doesn't only apply to the communist, you know, democratic, centralist, Leninist parties, which then evolved into Stalinism. It also applied to all of the social democratic ones. Now, if you look even at the Swedish party, it, you know, could make uh, communist parties blush in terms of how top-down bureaucratic it is. Conferences every three years, you know, it can be good in policy terms, but in terms of democracy, not at all. And why that matters is not just a matter of the accountability of the leadership. It matters especially because a undemocratic socialist party is not developing the capacities of its members, of its supporters, to govern their lives, to engage what is socialism except the ability of ordinary people collectively mm to engage in the broad range of decision-making that collective life is all about, whether it's in the community, whether it's at the workplace, whether it's in the school, uh, whether it's in the media. Uh, and and the, the assumption uh, that people know how to do this 
uh, is wrong. I think that's the anarchist assumption. Uh, the assumption that people can never do it leads you to technocracy and bureaucracy, uh, you know, which is not socialism. So party democracy, for instance, the Labour Party, that would, if it was successful, that continued exercise of party democracy necessarily prefigures radical democratic socialist government. Yes, insofar as it isn't just a matter of securing reselection. It isn't just a matter of securing the accountability of members of parliament. It isn't just a matter of making sure that conference resolutions appear in the manifesto. No, it's a matter of the people who are voting for the party, who are engaged in the party, uh, developing their capacities as political actors, developing their understanding of how this bloody capitalist system works so they don't have to depend on some professor to tell them. So a successful socialist project necessarily has to have this... It has to happening. have that capacity, developing capacity uh, project. Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, it will not yield... I don't think it will yield socialism at all. It certainly won't yield the kind of socialism we're aiming for. Because often people in the Labour Party, people you know, on the good side, the right side of things, will say we need more political education. But it sounds to me like you view political education and democratisation of a socialist party as more or less one and the same thing. Yes, certainly as part of the same trajectory. That's right. Yep. Let's move to mandatory selection. That's been the big uh, conversation for conference so far. We're sort of doing the sort of the theoretical um, underpinnings of mandatory selection. Why is mandatory reselection so important? I guess we've already talked about that a bit, but in the present context, why is it so important? And in particular, why has it caused such consternation from the establishment, both outside the Labour Party, but also within it? Well, the achievement of the British establishment has been that uh, the Labour Party uh, has produced a class of career politicians uh, who uh, have no interest in transforming this society. In fact, they uh, are opposed to socialism. Now, that may be because they think it's romantic, because it'll lead to bad outcomes, etc. But the vast majority of Labour MPs are opposed to it. And how do you then have a socialist project where the parliamentary party, the vast majority of people in it, are against the project? Uh, even those, let us say, who are sympathetic to Corbyn, I think, uh, are not themselves well developed enough politically as the people close to Corbyn are uh, to be able to see this through, to take the initiatives they need to take, etc. Uh, you know, Blair engaged in his policy forums in an explicit project of educating people into the project of accommodating to Thatcherism, accommodating to the city of London, trying to ride the ersatz prosperity that that gave you. Uh, and, and the same thing now has to happen, not only with developing the political education at the level of the base of the party. It has to happen with the MPs. Reselection, therefore, can be a bit of a fetish. You can get rid of a uh, MP who has, you know, signed the letter against Corbyn, mm. who is very vocal about his opposition or her opposition, etc. And you put someone in place who has been, you know, riding the wave is involved in it, etc., but is quickly absorbed into the Westminster Boys Club that Parliament is. And it is modeled on a gentleman's club. Mm. It's very structure. Mm. Yes. Uh, and, and you therefore uh, can put too much emphasis on reselection and accountability itself. Uh, so I think that while the victories that have been won on this are important. It is elementary democratically principle, it seems to me, that 
a someone who gets a nomination in one round should have to stand in an open selection the next round. Obviously. Uh, it's only the British parliamentarist tradition mm. which sees the uh, parliamentary representative as accountable to the, the crown and to parliamentary sovereignty rather than popular sovereignty uh, that makes this seem so scandalous in the society. It's not scandalous in a republic. It's not scandalous in the United States. It's true that most congressmen do keep on getting nominated and running again normally because they have the funds mm. from businesses in uh, real estate companies in their local area to be able to do more advertising than anybody else. But it's taken for granted that they, there is no automatic incumbency. Mm. Right? Uh, so th this is an elementary democratic struggle, but it needs much, much more than this. And if it's just a matter of turning out MPs and putting in new ones, you'll find that the majority of those MPs won't be all that different from the old ones. What should the role of MPs be? Because if you speak to most Labour MPs, well, MPs from any party, but obviously we, we care more about Labour MPs because these are the people we're trying to either persuade or or ideally, I think, to have a, somebody who's more in agreement with the, the, the political project we're involved in. They would say, well, look, the system in this country is I'm elected, I go to Parliament, you delegate your sovereignty, like you say, to me. So you've criticised that and you've said that's an outgrowth of sovereign power representing the crown or serving the crown rather than the people. What should the demand be on MPs? What kinds of functions should MPs be performing when they are elected on the behalf of the Socialist Party? When Tony Benn stood in Bristol for his first nomination in 1950-51, and he was asked how he would define the role of an MP. He said, then I would see my function as educating people to socialism. He said that in 51. Wow. And he often said it to me later, that he saw his role as that of a political educator. Uh, and I, I think that's the responsibility that an MP should have. Uh, a socialist member of parliament should, of course, be concerned with uh, introducing legislation and if it's in government, uh, engaging in the process of being at the head of a department in order to transform it from being the type of institution which in its pores is organized to reproduce capitalism and its social relations mm -hmm. into the type of institution that is oriented to building a democratic socialist society. That's a big task. But in order to be able to do that, the representative uh, needs to be a political educator, uh, needs to be able to develop the ambitions and the capacities of the people who have elected them uh, to be you know, capable of seeing through the democratic socialist project. Uh, you know, you can't leave it to the career representatives, you know, those people who when they go study PPE at Oxford uh, and join uh, the old style young labor uh, and then end up working uh, in one of the MPs or offices in Westminster are going to have a career and, and feel they have a job entitlement. Uh, no, you, you, this is not the way forward, and, and, and this is being challenged and, and successfully, I think. But a rejoinder from those kinds of people, they would say, all of the things you just outlined, um, holding the government to account when you're in opposition, being part of government, means that you can't, it's not possible to do that properly, and also be, as you say, a socialist educator, to be somebody that's serving a movement outside parliament as much as representing them inside parliament. So what's your answer to them? Because they, they would say there's only 24 hours in a day. Yeah, there are always constraints on resources, on time, uh, of course. Uh, and we're engaged in something very ambitious that involves uh, expanding our own capacities uh, to operate more efficiently, but also to have a sense of priorities. And I think that if we only have 24 hours a day, then 
people who are representatives need to recalibrate their priorities. There's no recipe for this. Mm. We are engaged in the 21st century in a process of discovery. It's increasingly desperate that the, the, the path of discovery we're on be realized because if it isn't, what's clear in the 21st century is that capitalism is throwing up undemocratic alternatives, not even liberal or bourgeois democratic ones. It's, you know, Adorno once said, he who speaks of fascism and doesn't speak of capitalism should remain silent. What I fear in the 21st century is that he who speaks of capitalism and does not speak of fascism should remain silent. So, yeah, we are in a process in the 21st century of figuring out how to do socialism as a political project uh, that goes beyond the failures of socialists in the 20th century. It's an enormous responsibility. Final question. Um, we had a debate, a small debate, I suppose, in this country on the left about the General Secretary of the Labour Party. Mm. Um, and my view was the General Secretary should be elected mm. because once Labour, hopefully under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, and obviously after him as well, once a socialist Labour Party with a socialist leader is in government, I can't understand how the Prime Minister can serve both the country yeah. and implement a radical um, platform of, of changes that would transform society. I can't see how they can do both that and transform the party into, because clearly it would have to be elevated in the context of a Labour government, right? That movement would be what keeps them in power. And that's why I said, well, you need to have a separate head almost at the head of the Labour Party because when we are in government, when Labour is in government, this movement will no longer be a movement, it will be a machine and it will be something that's occasionally mobilised rather than Absolutely. enthused I, and... I totally agree with this. One of the things I found most astonishing about the Syriza experience, and that was the one radical left government that emerged in the whole world out of the crisis of 2008. I mean, really astonishing. And... and uh, what they were engaged in was very difficult as a government, and they were given very little time to do it by the bloody EU, with virtually no support from the Northern European labor movements. When they finally were forced to sign the Memorandum of Agreement, it was either that or get out of the European Union, yeah. not just the Eurozone. So they did it in the hope that they would eventually be able to get it to a situation where they, their social agenda mm -hmm. a few years down the road might be taken up. The general secretary resigned and left the party. The general secretary of the party resigned and left the party. On the contrary, what should have happened was that people in the party should have redoubled their efforts mm -hmm. to build the party, to build capacities. That's what should have happened. And, and it's essential, I think, therefore, that the general secretary be elected, see his or her responsibility as changing the party so it is a educative, developmental force. And of course, we're not going to be able to achieve socialism in one government. The forces that are arraigned against this are immense. That government will need itself to discover how to introduce non-reformist reforms, reforms that people need but don't close off the possibility of going beyond them. Uh, it'll be constrained in all kinds of ways. It can't simply expect the party to be a supportive, mobilizing device for that government, right. precisely because that government is so constrained in the struggle it's engaged right. in. So yes, the, the party has to have its own thrust, its own dynamic. And the tragedy of the Labour Party, of course, is that for so long, its regional organizers have been highly skilled at expelling people. Uh, and and, and you know, that's a terrible, terrible, not simply waste of resources, but misuse of resources. Great, on that note, thank you very much, Leo. Good Pleasure as always. Yeah. And before we go, 
This is the 2019 edition of Socialist Register. Yes, it is. Where can our viewers find this? Uh, they can uh, pick it up in good bookstores everywhere. They can order it from the Merlin Press, which is a wonderful socialist publisher. We couldn't do what we do without really quite impoverished socialist publishers, even more impoverished than uh, social media guys like you. <laughs> um, and, and so just go to www.merlinpress.com or www.thesocialistregister.com and you can order it. Um, and you can subscribe very cheaply to a uh, e-edition as well. Founding editor Ralph Miliband says it all. <laughs> Thank you again, Good to be Jen. Here.